Hello and welcome to our third lesson for our Calgary Bible Institute. Our course here is Biblical Counseling and I'm glad that you tuned in tonight. We're going to be looking at two types of problems and then Christian integration. So I want to start by addressing the question, what problems do we as human beings face? I'm not talking about trials necessarily but what type of problems do we experience internally? I personally believe that there are only two types of problems. Body or physical problems, or soul or spiritual problems. If man is body and soul, and I believe that the Bible teaches that, we have both a material and immaterial part, then it would stand to reason that those are the two arenas where we would face problems. The reason we're looking at this question is because psychologists and psychiatrists have basically invented a third category of problems, mental problems or uh, emotional dysfunction. And we want to examine biblically if that is accurate. I'll give you my opinion here and we'll try and look at some scripture to see if what I am suggesting is accurate. But it is my opinion that the brain can be diseased, but the mind cannot. So mental disorders, I believe, are a category that have largely been invented by modern psychologists and psychiatrists. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, didn't Nebuchadnezzar go crazy? Are you saying he didn't have mental dysfunction? The incident we're referring to is in Daniel chapter 4, where God lets... Nebuchadnezzar's mind go crazy actually makes his mind go crazy as a judgment on him. But in Nebuchadnezzar's case, his problem was spiritual, not primarily physical. Think about it. Nebuchadnezzar didn't go crazy because he had a chemical imbalance. He didn't start eating grass because he had mental dysfunction. Nebuchadnezzar's primary problem was not, not a, a mental disorder. His root problem was pride against God. And so God judged him by letting him go crazy. So God can certainly allow the human mind to go crazy as an act of judgment, as in the case of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not suggesting if you know somebody that would have bizarre behavior, I'm not saying that God is judging them. That's not what I'm asserting at all. But in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, it was very clearly not a uh, a physically caused issue. It was a spiritual problem that led to Nebuchadnezzar's mental issues. So I believe there are only two types of problems, physical problems and spiritual problems. Now, those two categories of problems sometimes work in tandem in what we'll call a combo meal, Because physical problems such as illness, disease, injury, sleeplessness, any kind of physical problem, a biological problem, often becomes a temptation to unspiritual responses. When we're sick, particularly for extended periods of time or injured or having trouble sleeping, we're prone to fear and worry, and anger, and bitterness, and sometimes despair. So the physical problems become a temptation to unspiritual responses. And it works the other way, too. Spiritual problems do, at times, lead to physical problems. So a worrier may develop some uh, ulcers or, or difficulties like that. Or somebody who's immoral may contract an STD that negatively affects the body. So physical problems can become a temptation to unspiritual uh, unspiritual responses, and spiritual problems can lead to physical problems. We could call those accompanying problems or combo meals. But we're still only left with two types of problems, physical problems or spiritual problems. Sometimes they work in tandem and makes it more difficult for us as human beings to respond properly, but there are still only two types of problems. So who should treat these problems? Because a psychologist or psychiatrist would say, well, we should treat these uh, mental disorders. 
But if there are only two types of problems, physical problems should be treated by a medical doctor. As Christian counselors, most of us aren't medical doctors, so we should encourage people that we're counseling to go get a physical, to get blood work done, to have thorough checkups. We want to know about medical history, and we also want to defer them to uh, medical doctors for testing because they simply have expertise that we don't have, and we don't have to pretend that we're medical doctors. Physical problems, genuine biological problems, organic problems, should be treated by medical doctors. Spiritual problems should be treated with biblical solutions. The only remedy for spiritual problems are spiritual solutions. Because spiritual problems, by definition, will have a spiritual solution. There is no realm for the psychologist or the psychiatrist. And I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm just suggesting that in modern day psychology, the psychologist and the psychiatrist, they appear to have a created a need for their trade. Because what realm of problems are they to deal with? If physical problems are primarily medical doctors, and then you do have James 5 type situation calling for the pastors of the church to come and pray, or spiritual problems which will have biblical solutions. This third category, in my opinion, is not a category at all. Let me see if I can demonstrate this from Scripture. Because Scripture is our authority, you don't need to take my word for it. Let's look at Scripture together. Proverbs 15 and verse 13. Proverbs 15 and verse 13. I'd encourage you to turn there or flip there on your phone to see what Scripture says. Solomon says in verse 13 in Proverbs 15, A joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. He says if you have a happy heart, your face will show it. Our facial expressions express, uh, reflect our emotional state. And our emotional state, from what the Bible teaches, simply reflects the condition of our hearts. So our emotions indicate what is going on in our hearts. And if our hearts are happy, then that will wreck itself in our emotions and even show it in our facial expressions. But here in Proverbs 15, 13, he says, when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. If we live perpetually sad because of what's going on around us, that affects our zeal for living. We lose heart. So repeated inappropriate responses to trials will end up leading to despair and possibly even depression. What do I mean by inappropriate responses to trials? We all have trials, but we don't have to respond in sinful anger. We don't have to complain about it. We don't have to be ungrateful to the Lord. If a believer even responds to hard times with anger, complaining, ingratitude, they will, according to what Proverbs is teaching, they will end up in despair and possibly even depression. And I think here when he says the spirit is broken, broken, that's what many moderns would call clinical depression. That there is a complete loss of zeal for life. They're so depressed that they've lost the desire to try and do anything meaningful. Or Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14. Proverbs 18, 14. A similar idea here. Solomon says, The spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? The spirit of a man can endure his sickness, but as for a broken spirit, who can bear it? I think Solomon is here teaching two types of problems. One physical, one spiritual. Physical is in the first part of the verse. He says, the spirit of a man can endure his sickness. People have endured through cancer and Crohn's disease and all kinds of debilitating sicknesses, biological, organic sicknesses. It doesn't have to break the spirit. 
But when that spirit is broken, it says, who can bear it? Well, what's going to break a spirit? What's going to what's going to take away a person's desire to to accomplish meaningful things in life and to despair and to lose hope? It is going to be inappropriate responses, unspiritual responses to life's crises. So somebody treats you bad, you lose a job, a child wanders from the Lord, you get bad news about a sickness. If you respond to those things in a biblically appropriate way, you will not have emotional problems. Because emotional problems are a reflection of what's going on in our heart. And if our heart is right before the Lord, then we can experience joy and peace, even in the midst of trials. And some people say, well, I can't control how I feel. Is that true? Well, it depends on what they mean by it. If they, if they mean that they haven't been able to sleep well recently and so their body feels terrible, that's an organic thing, right? But when a person says, I can't control how I feel, if they're talking about love and joy and peace and anger and grief, the types of emotions that the scripture commands us to experience at certain times, then that is not a biblical statement. We are responsible as believers with the help of the Holy Spirit, empowered by the word, for experiencing the right emotions, manifesting the right emotions. Think about our Lord Jesus. He was never angry when he shouldn't have been. He was distressed and grieved at times. He experienced negative emotions, but never sinful emotions. He was joyful. He was um, distressed by other people's sin. He was angered by other people's sin at times. So the Lord Jesus, as our example, shows us that we are responsible for how we feel in the sense of emotion. Now, emotion and feelings overlap, but they're not identical. Some of our feelings are just simply biological that we cannot control. And that's not sinful to feel bad biologically, organically. But it is sinful to experience the wrong emotions, sinful emotions. So what Solomon is saying here in Proverbs 18, 14 is that a broken spirit is unbearable for us as human beings. Physical sickness, though excruciating at times, the first part of the verse tells us, is bearable. But when we lose heart, life becomes unbearable. We lose our sense of direction and purpose. Physical sickness is not identical to emotional depression, if I'm understanding Proverbs 18.14 correctly. If our emotions are simply the reflection of our heart's condition, then emotional problems are a spiritual issue and thus would have a spiritual remedy. So, are the, is there a third type of problems not covered in Scripture? These mental disorders? I don't think so. Now, the brain uh, certainly can be diseased, and there are uh, malfunctions in our DNA and things like that. But what we're talking about are the so-called emotional problems. When our emotions are disturbed, that just means that something is wrong in our life or in our responses. So, Dr. Jim Berg has used the illustration many times about our emotions just being like a warning light on the engine of our, on the, on the dashboard of our cars. It's flashing. It's saying, you better pay attention. Something's wrong under the hood. You better deal with it. That's the way our emotions are. We don't, we, don't, we don't get mad and say, oh, my emotions aren't working correctly because I'm so angry or, or depressed. No, our emotions are functioning as they ought to be. God warning us, we better address something under the hood. And in, th in this illustration, under the hood means our hearts. Our emotions are just reflecting what's going on under the hood in our hearts. So if our emotions are disturbed, then we need to look at our hearts. So I think a lot of things have been improperly labeled in our day. And I would like to suggest to you that most labeled disorders today, which you're going to find in the DSM-5, the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, the fifth edition, most of what you're going to find in there labeled disorders are actually spiritual problems. 
In other words, they're not physically caused and thus they don't have a physical solution. There's no drug you can take to fix it. It's not physically caused. It's spiritually caused and consequently it will have a spiritual remedy. In my opinion, and I'm letting you know it's my opinion, most clinical depression is spiritual in nature, not physical. Most clinical depression, I believe, is spiritual in nature. Same thing with bipolar and, and things like that. Now, there are exceptions, for sure, to this uh, principle about clinical depression. For instance, my grandfather struggled with depression in his midlife, and, and it was largely caused by a vitamin deficiency. And once they got that vitamin deficiency sorted out, he did a lot better. But for believers, even if our bodies are not working properly, even if there is something organically going on in us, perhaps related for ladies after childbirth, or maybe a brain tumor, or a vitamin deficiency, or a sleep deficiency, even if our bodies are not working properly, we are still responsible for how we choose to think about life. We can still experience the right emotions even if our bodies aren't feeling good. We are responsible by the grace of God for how we choose to think. Even when there's spiritual warfare going on and Satan or his demons plant a thought in your mind, we are responsible as believers to resist that, to stand against that. We are responsible for how we choose to think. So I believe that unspiritual responses, immature responses to genuine biological problems are what lead to most of our psychological disorders today. Let me say it another way. Most of our psychological disorders are because of unspiritual, ungodly, immature responses to biological problems or to trials around us. So I think we've labeled a lot of things improperly and we've deferred to psychologists and psychiatrists and said, here, you take over what the church used to do in the care of souls. That's what psychology means, the study of the soul. We said, you take care of it and we'll leave that up to you because we don't feel competent. We don't think we have the answers. Well, the question is, is where are those answers found? Do secular psychologists have that answer, or does the Bible have the answer? Well, some Christian counselors, in fact, most Christian counselors today, would try and take a mediating position and say, well, secular psychology has some of the answers, and the Bible has some of the answers, and so let's integrate them. Let's mix them together. This is what is called Christian integration an attempt to mix biblical principles with secular psychological theories and counseling. And it dominates. It rules the day in most Christian counseling. If you have the notes, I've got a chart there on what integration has looked like over the past decades in Christian circles. What psychological integration has looked like. And I'm indebted to Dr. Steve Cruz, one of my seminary professors, for some of this material from his class, Theories of Counseling. Much of it is, is my material. Some of it is my material, but some of it is his, and I want to give him credit there. So some of the influential Christian integration counselors, those that tried to mix theology and psychology, Perhaps the most influential early evangelical integrationist was a fellow named Clyde Naramore. And some of you uh, older believers will remember that name. Perhaps you read some of his stuff. He founded the Rosemead School of Psychology, which worked with Biola, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, and Talbot Seminary. And Talbot is, I believe, where Dr. John MacArthur went, and thankfully, Dr. MacArthur did not seem to be negatively influenced by the Christian integration. Perhaps it was just in its seminal stages back in that day. But Naramore taught that psychology can be helpful if you're careful. But apparently, in the next generations of believers, we've, we have not heeded uh, his approach 
We've gone farther than he went. Naramor is considered by many to be the pioneer of Christian psychology. He gave credibility to the idea of a Christian consulting psychology. He opened the door to the attempt to weld theology and psychology. James Dobson is perhaps the most well-known Christian integrationist from his days with Focus on the Family. I don't think he's with Focus on the Family anymore. He has his own show called Family Talk now. He was influenced by Clyde Naramore. And Dr. Dobson is a prolific teacher on discipline, family relationships, marriage. He really has a burden to try and strengthen families. And to a certain extent, he's been successful on that. But you get stuff from Focus on the Family, and it's really a mixed bag because they do allow for integration. So some of their articles will be extremely helpful and biblical. And some of their other articles might leave you scratching your head because it's secular psychology repackaged. And Dr. Dobson was influential on a popular level broadly in North America. He had a PhD and he has a PhD in psychology. Well, Gary Collins was more popular on the academic level. He taught at Bethel College in St. Paul, Minnesota, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago, Liberty University in Virginia. He was a graduate of McMaster University in Hamilton and the University of Toronto, so he's a Canadian. He was a clinical psychologist. And he is well known for organizing the AACC, which is the American Association of Christian Counselors. He, too, is an integrationist counselor. Larry Crabb, another familiar and influential integrationist, taught at Grace Theological Seminary there in Winona Lake, Indiana. He's now has his own ministry called New Way Ministries. He's thoroughly integrationist. He said, the root of all our personal and emotional problems is a lack of togetherness. He was talking about closeness with God and closeness with other people. There's a certain extent, to a certain extent, there's some truth there. But Dr. Crabb was a uh, psychologist who was definitely an integrationist. Two more well-known integrationists, Frank Minareth and Paul Meyer. They started new life clinics all across the USA. They've split since then, but they practice systemic therapy, which is an, an unbiblical psychological theory. It's not rooted in, in Bible truth by and large. And they were quite influential and still have influence in the Christian integration scene. And one more I'll mention is Dr. Kevin Lehman with the ministry Couples of Promise. He wrote the birth order book about where you're born in the family and how that affects you and have a new kid by Friday and sex starts in the kitchen. He has written many books on marriage, parenting, self-help. He's an integrationist as well. I saw him a few years ago on 100 Huntley Street. I haven't watched 100 Huntley Street in a long time, but I did notice him on there, and he's an integrationist counselor as well. And what you'll find with these integrationists is that it's a mixed bag. There are some biblically helpful principles there, but there's a lot of secular psychological theories that are not, are not Bible-based and are sometimes... Uh, not just non-biblical, but actually contradict the Bible, are unbiblical. There is a liberal wing in, in broader Christendom on integration, Paul Turnier and, and a couple others, but I'll just, for our purposes, focus on the evangelicals. It's affected schools, this integration. Let me give you a couple examples. Taylor Seminary. In Edmonton, which is part of the North American Baptist Conference, one of our church members went to school there, and it was quite an experience. Him as a, a Bible believer, uh, this was decades ago even, him as a Bible believer in a school that claimed to believe the Bible, but in practice did not. Their counseling program in their seminary, this is what they say on their website, it says it integrates psychology and theology. They're not ashamed of it. They believe it's the right thing to do, as 
most Christian counselors today do. Or take Trinity Western in Langley, B.C., which was founded by the Evangelical Free Churches of America, from what I understand. I don't know if they're still connected to the EV Free Churches. But I looked through the courses, the required courses for their MA in counseling. And one of the course descriptions, Theories of Counseling, describes their process of integration. Students are introduced to the process of integrating theories as they develop their own framework for counseling practices. And as I look through the different courses for this counseling degree in this Christian university, Trinity, which claims to be the premier Christian university in all of Canada, I saw scant, if any, references to biblical principles. It was secular psychological theories. So nearly every so-called Christian school today would teach some form of Christian integration. And I'm not saying it's not helpful at all, but just because it's called biblical counseling or Christian counseling doesn't mean that it's thoroughly biblical. What are the results of we as Christians try, as a church, the church as a whole, trying to integrate secular psychological theories with biblical counseling? Well, first of all, we've unwittingly validated the medical model of problems. What do I mean by the medical model of problems? The medical model is the view that abnormal behavior, emotional problems, is primarily caused by something in our bodies. And some of the earlier psychologists taught that taught a medical model that based emotional problems, mental disorders, on, for instance, damage to the central nervous system. Well, the medical model that is largely popular today is a model that's based on this supposed chemical imbalance, teaching that our emotional problems, our mental disorders are are caused by this elusive chemical imbalance that there's not scientific proof for, but it is a very popular theory today. And Christian integration has largely validated that medical model. So if that's the case, then people should go to psychologists. They should go to psychiatrists. But remember, we saw that the Bible doesn't seem to teach the three types of problems. A second result of the integration of psychology and theology is the denial of the sufficiency of scripture. Now, most integrationist counselors or psychologists and psychiatrists aren't going to verbally deny the sufficiency of scripture, but many of them in practice do just that. They, they do not treat the Bible as if, as if it's sufficient for life's spiritual problems, even the very complex ones of today. A third consequence of this integration is the reinforcement of many unbiblical teachings of psychology, such as Freud's subconscious and repressed memories and the humanistic psychology of self-esteem and self-worth, this victim mentality that dominates much of secular psychology that our parents, our churches are responsible for our hypersensitive consciences, this uh, perpetual victimhood that so dominates today. And I'm not making light of those who have been victims of, of tragic life circumstances. That's not my purpose at all here. But our culture just loves to pin the blame for our problems on other people. And Christian integration has largely reinforced that. Hasn't met that head on. It's, it's succumbed to it. Another consequence is that there's been a failure to substance, substantively help Christians who are in need of truly biblical counseling. Secular psychological theories just don't have the answers to the deepest needs of the human heart. Dr. Cruz summarizes the dire consequences of our attempts at Christian integration. He says revelation has been replaced with observation. Sinfulness has been replaced with sickness. Repentance has been replaced with recovery. Hence all the talk about recovery groups. And not that they don't do any good. That's not what I'm suggesting. 
but most of them are just putting putting a band-aid on something that needs deep surgery. Self-denial has been replaced with self-esteem, and the care of souls has been replaced with the cure of minds. And we as a church has, have largely gone along with secularized psychologists and said, okay, the Bible apparently doesn't speak to these deep needs of the human heart, or at least not in a meaningful and substantive way. But I want to challenge us as Christians and counselors and friends as we talk and share advice with one another. Why would we incorporate the teachings of secular psychologists into our counseling? Again, not all psychology is bad. Some of the research psychology is actually quite helpful and interesting. But when we're talking about what are the problems of the human heart and what are the remedies for the problems of the human heart? Secular psychology doesn't have the answers. Only the Bible has the answer from that. So why would we incorporate these attempts at trying to remedy the problems of the human heart and mind when the major influences in psychology, and you remember that would be Carl Rogers with his humanistic philosophy, Albert Ellis with his cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the most common therapy today, and Freud's psychoanalytic theory. Those are probably the three most influential psychologists of all time. And when we looked at their personal lives a few weeks ago, we saw that these men were not just uh, pagans. They were, they were very wicked, even by pagan standards. Why would we think that they could teach us something about the human mind and heart? Why would we incorporate the major teachings of secular psychologists as Christians when secular psychologists can't even agree on how to help their patients? And the evidence for that is that there are more than 400 varieties of psychotherapies today. So which one's right? Is it just a smorgasbord? Just pick what works for you? See, there's no standard. There's no authority. And why would we incorporate the major teachings of secular psychologists into our counseling as Christians when psychological therapies have largely failed to provide meaningful help to most of its patients? Its track record is not good at all. So what is our alternative to this? It's God's truth. It's the assurance that the word is sufficient for the deepest spiritual needs of the human heart. And that's where we will turn our attention in the next class. I'm grateful for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out by email or by phone. I'll do my best to try and answer those. But I appreciate you taking the time to work through this with me, and I hope it's been helpful for you tonight.